Sing of James Connolly and brave men like Piers Who fought a rebellion for a free Irish race But the leader among them long kept in the dark Is our own rebel hero, the bold Thomas Clark Raised up in Dungannon in the county Tyrone where all through his youth was his bold rebel's home And with his brave comrades in the old IRB He started his fight that this land might be free Through his life as a rebel he did undergo the cruelest of torture that mankind could know Fifteen years penal servitude, silent and dark Went that true son of Ireland, the bold Thomas Clark From the small shop in Dublin he worked day and night To rally the people against England's might had once tried to break him, his spirit to kill But our own Thomas Clark was unconquered in will My name is Mee Holland uh, and I'm a historian uh, I'm Helen Lytton and I'm a great niece of Kathleen Clark who was married to Tom Clark the, the man behind the uh, Easter Rising, basically, I, I like to think of him as the Sven Galli of the mm. Rebellion. Tom Clark is one of the most important figures that we can remember. Well, the Tom Clark was born in 1858 and in England and was born to a British soldier and his wife, Mary, from Tipperary. And uh, the first few years of his life were spent in South Africa, where his father was sent. And his father then came back to Dungannon when Tom was about seven or eight years old. So he spent his for formative years growing up in Dungannon. Well, he was became in interested in the way Catholics were treated in Dungannon. He, uh, Dungannon was a very sectarian town. Mm. There was a good deal of discrimination. Mm. And Catholics lived in the poorest areas and had difficulty getting jobs and so on. And he became aware of these inequalities and was anxious to do something about them. Uh, his father was very much a supporter of the British Empire and assured him that there would be no point in trying to fight the British Empire. But Tom said he'd just keep on battering until something happened. Tom's father's family were Protestant. James joined the British Army during the worst years of the Great Famine and saw service in the Crimean War and was awarded a medal for three battles and a siege. He married Mary Palmer, a Catholic. They had a son. Thomas James Clark, on 11th of March, 1858, and baptised a Catholic. His father was made sergeant of the Ulster Militia. James and his growing family moved into Anne Street, Dungannon. He was sworn into the IRB by John Daly from Limerick, who was mm -hmm. the IRB head centre, was, and Connemara was going around swearing people in, visited Dungannon and it attracted Tom's attention very much and Tom was sworn into the IRB with a couple of his friends including Billy Kelly and, um, and he was a very intelligent young man and in fact had done a stint as sort of a pupil teacher mm. at his school they did wanted him to stay on at the school mm. um, and he clearly had was strong minded as well sure. there was also I think a certain resistance to his father's ideas his father wanted him to join the British Army yeah. like himself yeah. and, and as his younger brother subsequently did uh, but he, he was very determined that he wanted Britain out of Ireland. He couldn't see any any way forward for Ireland under colonial rule. Then there was a, one day there was a, a Lady Day procession, the Feast of the Assumption. Uh, the Catholics held a procession and it was attacked. Hmm. And the police joined, came came along and were at, had thrown stones thrown at them and they fired on the crowd and somebody was injured. Um, they, it was supposed. Then that was Tom who had fired, somebody fired a shot and it was supposed that it was Tom. He and his pals decided probably they were better off out of Dungannon. And the pals all had a, one, an American wake and set off for New York. Um, Tom didn't tell his parents or anyone else that he was going and just sneaked out that night and followed them 
uh, to the port and went to New York with them. When he, when he landed in New York, he joined an Apertandy club mm. of the of Clana Gael uh, and became very involved, became his secretary. He was obviously very active and, and busy and intelligent and did well in the organisation. Tom Clark arrived at Clana Gael's Napertandy club. John Kenny, who was president of the club at the time, remembered Tom Clark as a bright, earnest, wiry, alert young fellow. The Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel, who instituted the famous Nobel Peace Prizes in 1867, had a technological breakthrough in the field of explosives. He took out a patent for dynamite. Uh, the Napper Tandy Club was involved in teaching explosives, how to handle explosives, which were pretty new. Dynamite was a very new material then, and people were learning how to use it. The club's purpose was to instruct its members in the use of explosives under the tutelage of Dr. Thomas Gallagher. Lessons included trips to Staten Island to experiment on rocks with nitroglycerine. The idea of a dynamiting campaign was strongly supported by Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa and Patrick Ford, editor of the Irish World. O'Donovan Rossa began to raise money through Ford's Irish World for a dynamite campaign in England. In early 1883, Tom Clark was about to become manager of the Brighton Beach Hotel near Coney Island. This was a large, well-known establishment. In 1883, uh, Tom was informed that he was about to be sent to England to take part in the dynamite campaign. Uh, with teams of Irish-American dynamite hards travelling to the United uh, Kingdom uh, to reconnoitre so sites for dynamite attacks in British cities uh, in retaliation for British policy during the land war in Ireland. Irish tenant farmers had no right to a written lease. When a rent agreement had ended, usually 12 months, they could be evicted. They could not claim compensation for any improvements they had made on the farm. Oh yes, and he was clear he wanted to, he wanted to free Ireland from Britain's rule, mm. British rule. He was suddenly ordered by Timothy O'Reardon to leave his work and prepare for an early voyage. All of their activities were being observed by Le Caron's intelligence network, and information was passed back to Britain about them. Clark had travelled separately from the others, on a vessel which struck an iceberg. Rescued by a passing ship, he was landed in Newfoundland. He gave his name as Henry Hammond Wilson, and said he was an Englishman going home. Because of the shipwreck, the spies who had been following him lost track of him, and he was able to land at Liverpool quite unobserved. Um, he arrived in England and made contact with Thomas Gallagher and a chap called Whitehead. The first clan mission was headed by the Brooklyn resident, Dr Thomas Gallagher, and consisted of James J Murphy, John Kent, William Lynch and Thomas J Clark. Joined by Gallagher's brother, uh, Bernard, they set about establishing a bomb manufacturing factory in Birmingham disguised as a paint and decoration shop under the ownership of Murphy. From Murphy's shop in Birmingham, nitroglycerine explosive was manufactured and transported to London by means of rubber bags and fish stockings enclosed in large portmanteau and boxes. And it was planned to attack major symbolic political sites in London sometime in late April 1883. Lynch having tra travelled from Murphy's Explosives Factory, had been followed to a Birmingham, uh, by a Birmingham police sergeant uh, to London, and his lodgings there raided, uh, where he was found to be in possession of nitroglycerine, a number of photographs, a map of London, and an envelope bearing the name of Thomas Gallagher. Uh, fearing news of Lynch's arrest, the Birmingham constabulary chose to search Murphy's shop soon afterwards, uh, where police had discovered over 170 pounds of nitroglycerine. Following this extensive search, an, an eager constable discovered a notebook signed by Henry Hammond Wilson. This, of course, was Tom Clark's alias, um, and a letter giving his address at Nelson Square in London. Now, with the net beginning uh, to close around Clark, the police uh, were mobilised under Inspector John Littlechild. The child waited for Clark's arrival at his apartment uh, prior to raiding the accommodation. At half past one, Clark arrived with Gallagher. As he turned the key to open his apartment door, police swooped on the two men. On investigation, 
Little child found Clark had a large portmanteau in his room containing, as they said, two India rubber cases, each about two feet long, apparently full of something. On Monday the 11th of June 1883, Thomas Clark, under his alias of Hammond, stood trial with his colleagues accused of attempting to level war upon the Queen in order to compel her to change her measures and counsel and in order to intimidate and overawe both Houses of Parliament. Lynch had been turned. He'd become an informer and he offered his assistance to the prosecution to secure a conviction of the team. And his evidence indicated a number of targets the Dynamitards had intended to attack, including the Palace of Westminster. There is significant evidence, however, to suggest that Lynch was lying, as were the other prosecution witnesses. Clark recalled, We were hustled out of the dock into the prison van, surrounded by a troop of mounted police, and driven away at a furious pace through the howling mobs that thronged the streets from the courthouse to Millbank Prison. Through his life as a rebel he did undergo the cruelest of torture that mankind could know Fifteen years penal servitude, silent and dark Went the true son of Ireland, the bold Thomas Clark Clark and his fellow dynamite arts were placed in temporary detention and were then conveyed to Chatham and Portland prisons, respectively. Clark, now facing the darkest period of his, right, of his life, recalled later, Had anyone told me before the prison doors closed upon me that it was possible for any human being to endure what Irish prisoners have endured in Chatham Prison? I'd come out of it alive and sane. I would not have believed him. Immediately, Clark learned that silence was rigidly enforced and that the convict should reflect on what he had done. Under no circumstances was he to make contact with fellow dynamite arts, and if he did, punishment would be severely enforced. The basic f fact of the regime was silence. It was okay. a silent system. It was called, you are not permitted to talk, you are not permitted contact with any other human being, you are not permitted even to look at other people or wink or smile. Using lead from the pivots of their cell doors, they, they, they made makeshift pencils and wrote messages on regulation brown paper. In the dreary, dark and dull atmosphere of the prison, this kind of communication with his fellow Irish prisoners was something he could look forward to and, and enjoy, despite the punishment it would bring if discovered. Clark recalls the harrowing story of dynamite arts being treated with contempt and anger within the walls of Chatham and Portland, finding they were treated as special men. These special men found jailers and wardens treated them as they pleased, often relinquishing ordinary rules for prison regulation and implementing an unvarying system of persistent harassment. We treason felony prisoners were known as the special men, kept not in ordinary prison cells but in penal cells, kept there so that we could be more conveniently persecuted, for the authorities aimed at making life unbearable for us. The ordinary rules regulating the treatment of prisoners, which, to some extent, shielded them from foul play and the caprice of petty officers, these rules, as far as they did that, were in our case set aside. This was a scientific system of perpetual and persistent harassing. Harassing morning, noon and night, and on through the night. Harassing always and at all times. Harassing with bread and water punishments, and other punishments with no sleep torture and other tortures. This system was applied to the Irish prisoners and to them only and was specially designed to destroy us mentally or physically, to kill or drive insane. As a result of the treatment dynamitards received in prison, many did break under the strain, drifting into psychosis and lunacy. Clark, or Hammond as he was known during his time in prison, uh, recalled his fear of looming insanity when he noticed a constant ringing uh, which he feared to be in his head. <laughs> he discovered this ringing was coming from a fresh telephone wire outside his cell window which he had not seen before. 
Tom also went into, he was, a, he was a very bright man, very intelligent, very mathematical, and he went into his own head hmm. to pass the hours and hours and hours of boredom. Uh, he would sort of work out how many nails there were in the door of his cell and then how many doors there were in the prison and therefore how many nails there were. He did it with bricks, he did it with everything. He did. It, he measured the amount of hair that was cut off everybody's head every, and, and made a, a calculation of how many feet of hair were cut at the prison every year, that sort of thing. Clark used rigorous mathematics as a way of keeping his sanity. He said, Not only have I counted every brick in my cell, I have worked out the total weight. Yes, many an hour have I spent turning that prison inside out, upside down, rearranging the bricks of it into a pyramid one time or into a square and so on. Uh, apparently did Tom complained that they would always be uh, checked by the prison warders every hour the, the door the, you know the, the, the door of the cell would sort of whack across. And sleep deprivation is, is a hugely cruel means of, of, of brutalising people, really, because it's very hard to recover from if you could never get enough sleep. And then quite a lot of the work they did was hard labour. Tom was working in, an iron, in a foundry, in an ironwork, and uh, it is thought that his, his later heart trouble might have been traceable to that. One by one I saw my fellow prisoners break, break down and go mad under terrible strain. Some slowly and by degrees others suddenly and without warning. Who next was the terrible question that haunted us day and night, and the ever-recurring thought that it might be myself added to the agony. The golden rules of life for a long sentence prisoner, according to Tom Clark. Clinch your teeth hard and never say die. Keep your thoughts off yourself all you can. Guard your self-respect. If you've lost that, you lose the backbone of your manhood. Keep your eyes wide open and don't bang your head against the wall. In 1884, Clark's imprisonment was made somewhat more bearable by the arrival to Chatham Prison of John Daly, who he knew from his days with the IRB in Dungannon. Like Clark, Daly had been arrested for possession of explosives at Wolverhampton train station. The arrival of Daly, as well as his IRB colleague James Francis Egan, gave Clark support and encouragement. Clark developed his own system of Morse code, punched the alphabet onto a sheet of paper with a sewing needle and passed it from prisoner to prisoner until we were able to send telegrams along six or seven cells. He worked in the print shop and set and published The Irish Felon in nine days on tissue paper which he hid in his shoes and clothes. Its byline was printed and published at Her Majesty's Convict Prison, Chatham, by Henry Hammond Wilson. Dr Gallagher had collapsed under the mental strain and he refused work, claiming to be God. He could not hold his food and began vomiting intensely, reducing himself to an extremely low physical state. Clark spent sleepless nights in the cell listening to Murphy fight against insanity, cursing England and English brutality from the bottom of his heart and beseeching God to strike him dead sooner than allow him to lose his reason. Clark discussed his fears with the Catholic chaplain who, while he did listen attentively, uh, dismissed the matter, fearing the prison authorities would cause trouble with his bishop if he raised them. Clark, while disheartened, was not to be beaten and he wrote to John Redmond MP detailing the treatment of his friends. He learned later that his letter had been suppressed by the authorities. Redmond however did uh, later uh, become to visit the dynamite arts and Clark was able to discuss his fears, finding the MP would approach the Home Secretary uh, to examine the men's condition. Now the Home Office agreed to this demand and doctors were sent into the hospital to examine Gallagher and Whitehead. However, they found the two were feigning insanity and looking for special treatment. This resulted in further punishment for the two dynamitards, worsening their mental situation. Convicts successfully publicised their sufferings by means of letters and visits from Irish politicians. 
The resulting public outcry was deafening, but despite a growing publicity campaign in the United States and in Ireland regarding their degrading punishment and treatment, continuous pleas and petitions for their release were ignored. In 1896, John Daly was released from prison on medical grounds. Clark found this the hardest part of his sentence, as he was now on his own in the prison. He recalled that his prison life had never been so lonely, and now lived in strict silence, alone with his thoughts. He found his imprisonment to be like a sailor's rope that had no end to it. As Clark lay in this cell, the one inspiration in his prison life was his love for Ireland. Tom was later to write, Irish freedom has gone on for centuries, and in the course of it, a well-trodden path has been made that leads to the scaffold and to the prison. Many of our revered dead have trod that path, and it was these memories that inspired me with sufficient courage to walk part of the way along that path with an upright head. In September 1898, Thomas J. Clark was finally released on licence from Portland Prison. The medical officer had concluded that his health had deteriorated as a result of his long imprisonment. He had chronic arthritis in his left knee and had developed a heart murmur. Was he completely released or was he...? No, he was like uh, Daly, he was, he, of all of them, he was released on licence, which meant mm. that if he transgressed or got into trouble, he'd go straight back into prison again. In fact, Tom was somebody that nobody knew anything about. And the, he only came to public attention when Daly was released and started to create and started to create a, a campaign for the release of the remaining prisoners, but specifically with reference to Tom. Uh, and Tom became more of a public figure just in people's minds then. So he was brought back to Dublin to popular acclaim and so on. But he was always a very... Um, he, he was not a man who liked publicity or being in the public eye. So when John Daly invited him down to Limerick, John Daly at this stage was the first nationalist mayor of Limerick and said he wanted to give the freedom of the city to Tom. Mm. And Tom was very reluctant to accept it. He wasn't one for public honours like that. But um, he, he was talked into coming down to Limerick and then met the whole of the Daly family there. So Kathleen was the third eldest. There were, oh. the, of the Daly sisters, there were eight Daly sisters okay. and one boy who was Ned, the youngest, mm. who had been born five months after his father died. Mm. And John Daly was, had, ran a bakery mm. in Limerick and the girls were basically employed in the bakery except to Cathy who ran her own dressmaking business. <coughs> Kathleen and Tom fell in love. There was about 20 years difference in age. And she was a bit disappointed when she saw him first because their uncle John had built him up to be this heroic figure, who, mm. you know, his great friend in prison. Yeah. And then there was this, <coughs> excuse me, this little um, insignificant looking, rather broken man of about 40 came out. But she said, you know, you only had to talk to him to realise the kind of person he was. Just the noise and bustle of being among people making ordinary noise yeah. after the years of silence. Yeah. And Tom just was absorbed into this huge uh, bus bustle of people and seems to have loved every moment of it. He seems to have blossomed. Mm. Uh, various friends and nationalist groups and so on tried to get him various public service jobs, mm. but he could never... He, he, was a, he was a felon. I mean, he was mm. a convicted felon on, li on, on license and really he wasn't a, 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 a good job prospect. Uh, they tried various things, uh, and he decided in the end he wanted he'd go back to New York and hope that maybe John Devoy could help him there. And he also worked as John Devoy's secretary and became more and more involved in the work of Clan Gale and helped set up a newspaper and that kind of thing. And in 1901, Kathleen followed him out to New York and they were married. Kathleen was determined to marry Tom, and she travelled to New York where they were married on 16th of July 1901 with John McBride as the best man. Well, they, they settled in America and he was working there for a while, But Kat, and they had their first child uh, called John Daly, who's John Daly Clark, and uh, Kathleen's health was not good, whether it was the birth or what. Mm. Uh, Kathleen seemed to have suffered from ill health during her life, but nobody ever quite specifies what it was. Okay. And of course she lived to 92, so yeah. you know she, she fought it off. But she, during their time in New York, she had several periods of convalescence, 
uh, in in nursing homes and that. Mm. Uh, and she was advised that the life in the city, the air in the city, was not good for her. So they moved to Long Island, mm. and they established. They, they bought a market garden and worked on that for a few years. And you can see from Kathleen's memoir that this is the time she was happiest. She, mm. she really loved li living in the country with chickens and yeah. you know living a good outdoor life. Um, but you could see that Tom was restless, and yeah. by 1907 he bec he knew that the currents in Europe were threatening that there might be a war. And he'd never really forgiven Ireland for not having done anything during the Boer War. This is when he was in prison, he couldn't have done anything about it, but he waited for people to do something to rise during the Boer War while Britain was occupied and, uh, you know, with, in South Africa and was busy. Uh, and nobody did anything, so he was thinking, well, look, if this is happening again, if Britain's getting involved in the war, we're going to do something this time. Uh, so he talked to Kathleen and finally persuaded her. I think she always knew when she married him that this was going to be the driving force in his mm. life and she wouldn't stand in his way. Um, but it took a lot of persuading because she knew their life would never be the same again. Mm. Okay, so he moved back from America to Ireland. Uh, could you tell me maybe what happened there then on his return? They arrived back in Limerick uh, in late 1907 and Kathleen stayed there with their son while Tom went up to Dublin to establish some kind of business. Now his uh, sister Hannah mm. already ran a tobacconist shop so she knew about the business and she was able to advise him uh, about setting it up and he looked for a small shop and he found a small shop in 55A Amien Street and started to set up the business there. Meanwhile Kathleen was having their second child, Tom mm. was born in 1908 in Limerick um, and Kathleen was very anxious to get up to Dublin because she was worried about Tom being on his own. She felt he wasn't looking after himself properly and was working too hard and not eating right. Okay. Um, so ultimately she left the, the, the baby with, with her mother and uh, came up to Dublin and they, they established the business then. And the baby Tom stayed in Limerick for at least a year, if not longer before his grand right. grandmother let him up. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yes. she, she was very attached to him. From the small shop in Dublin, he wore day and night To rally the people against England's might They had once tried to break him, his spirit to kill But our own Thomas Clark was unconquered in will How did that evolve from being just a musician to... Oh, well, I mean, he, he, he was establishing it as a business because he had a family to look after, but basically he was coming to Dublin to, to re reinstitute the IRB, mm. which had begun, which had sort of fallen into to disrepair, so to speak. There were mm. a few people there, but they weren't very active. Mm. So he was coming to, re to under the wing of Clan Na Gael to get the IRB up and moving again and to start planning towards a rising. And that was his aim in being in Dublin, which is why he didn't stay in Limerick. You know, yeah. Dublin would be more central. He had a great many contacts up north with the northern um, nationalists, such as um, Sean McDermott, Bulmer Hobson, Dennis McCullough. Um, gradually, these moved down to Dublin and became part of a group that centred around Tom and the shop. Mm. Uh, the shop became, he by this stage had a second shop in Parnell Street, and this became a real centre of, of nationalist and Republican activity. It's perfect. Tom Clark was sent here by the Clan de Gale with Clan de Gale funds. He was sent here with the intention to revitalize the IRB and its physical force. It always was. That was his intent. But what's more perfect than a news agent shop? More perfect than a pub. You got people conspiring in the corner of a pub all the time. Somebody walks in, gets a newspaper, there's a little message for him on the inside of it, he walks out. Somebody walks in, gets a packet of cigarettes, little message in there, he walks out. Somebody standing in the shop all day long watching a British tout, going to be very, very apparent to everybody. Perfect. It wasn't as though this was done in any way, you know, by haphazard manner. He did it in a very, very good fashion. Sean McGarry later recalled that from this time forward, Tom became the pivot of the whole separatist movement. Dennis McCullough. It was only after the advent of Tom Clark into the movement that it really shaped like taking serious action. It was watched, obviously, by the, the, the guard, by mm. the police, Secret Service, all the time. Mm. But they couldn't pick up Tom on anything because he wasn't breaking any law. He, mm. wasn't, he wasn't going outside yeah. the rules of his uh, release or anything like that. Yeah. He was just running this little news agent. But there was this constant stream of young men in and out yeah. into the back room, you know. Uh, 
and uh, he was bringing also money from Plan the Gay yeah. because John Devoy was sending money across sure. to establish things. So they were establishing newspapers and so on. But the big thing was, of course, the establishment finally of the, of the Irish Volunteers in mm. 1913. The Irish Freedom newspaper was replaced by the Irish Volunteer. As well as this, the Irish Volunteers were set up in 1914 by Owen McNeill. The UVF masterminded an illegal landing of arms and ammunition at Larne in 1914. The Irish Volunteers decided to do the same, landing 900 guns and 26,000 rounds of ammunition in Hoth. The IRB stayed away but realising the British Army troops were heading for Hoth, Clark and McDermott hired cabs and went to Hoth to help collect the arms. This was the opportunity which Clark had been hoping for all of his adult life. If Ireland did not move now, it would be damned forever. And the volunteers split yeah. after Redmond's speech. Redmond had said, Account yourselves as men, not only in Ireland itself, but wherever the firing line extends in defence of right, of freedom and religion in this war. Also, John Rebin demanded that the Irish Volunteers Provisional Committee, which had been controlled by Clark's IRB, had to accept 25 from Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party, which gave them a majority. Bulmer Hobson supported this. Clark never forgave him for what he considered treason. Sean McGarry I was with Tom Clark when the news came, and to say he was astounded is understating it. I never saw him so moved. He regarded it from the beginning as cold-blooded and contemplated treachery likely to bring about the destruction of the only movement in the century which brought promise of the fulfilment of all his hopes. A split in the Irish Volunteers occurred, with the Irish National Volunteers being Redmond supporters and a smaller, more hardline base of Irish Volunteers remained, including Clark and McDermott. The split put the IRB back in control of the organisation. Clark and McDermott became inseparable, effectively running the IRB. In 1915, Clark and McDermott established a military committee of the IRB to plan what later became the Easter Rising. The members were Porrick Pierce, Eamon Kant and Joseph Plunkett, with Clark and McDermott adding themselves shortly thereafter. Dennis McCullough I say with every confidence that Tom Clark's person and Sean McDermott's energy and organising ability were the principal factors in creating a group and guiding events to make the rising possible. The O'Donovan Ross uh, death, mm -hmm. he, he knew how to use that in a marketing capacity. Do you want to explain maybe what happened there? By early 1915, Tom was getting worried because it was clear that the volunteers were getting bored. I mean, they were marching up and down, they were drilling, they were doing this, mm. they were doing that, they were, they were doing a lot of training. But they were being jeered at in the streets for being toy soldiers. And mm. Proper soldiers should be out in France fighting mm. in, in, in the Great War. At that stage, Devoy cabled him and said, actually, John, you know, O'Donovan Rossa has just died. And Jer Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa was one of the early Fenians, the early Clan de Gael people who, who instituted the dynamite campaign in the first place. So anyway, so, so Tom said, well, he couldn't have done better for Ireland than to die just at this moment. That's absolutely perfect. Send him home yeah. and we'll have a huge funeral here. Yeah. And he spent weeks and weeks devising an immense funeral, uh, in which marched right through Dublin to Glasnell. And, and it was followed with hundreds of volunteers coming him on, the Irish Citizen Army. Sean McGarry. During the weeks preceding the funeral, Tom Clark's energy seemed to be inexhaustible, and the plans for the route and the dispositions of the various participating bodies, which appeared in the papers, were actually drawn by himself on the counter in his shop. There was a, there was a whole deal, a good deal of ceremony, and very well organised. Mm. Um, they had organised it for weeks, they had a proper printed programme. The final touch was that Tom picked Patrick Pierce to give the oration, oration over the grave, Pierce was one of the IRB people who, mm. whom he had introduced and he knew him as a good speaker and a good writer though. and so he picked Pierce, he knew he would do a good job mm. and Pierce said, what do you want me to say? And Tom said, look, throw discretion to the winds, make it as hot as hell. But the fools, the fools, the fools, 
They have left us our Fenian dead. And while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. It became the rallying cry of a nation, and Pierce's graveside oration is rightly famous. It was Tom Clark who choreographed and stage managed everything, not that you'd notice from the photographs. Uh, one photograph, for example, uh, we can see the graveside service, most people looking towards the priest, but Patrick Pierce suitably concentrating on prayer. Tom Clark is not by Pierce's side. Instead, we find him to, uh, out of the limelight, way off to Pierce's left, watching him anxiously while others are looking towards the priest. Quite a few of the people who later joined the volunteers and come to Mon said in their witness statements that it was watching the O'Donovan Rossa funeral. They became aware that this was a huge movement, that it was very well organised and mm. drilled and seemed to know what it was doing. Leslie Price, coming to Mon, Dublin. When the armed volunteers passed, I then suddenly realised that the men I had seen, Tom Clark, the O'Rahilly, Sean McGarry, looked as if they meant serious business. This aspect of the funeral and the reading of Pierce's oration the following day made such a deep impression on my mind that on the following Thursday night I joined the art crave of the common demand. I joined from conviction. Did he get on with James Connolly and the Citizen Army or not? Certainly mm. the IRB were very dubious about Connolly because mm. he was separate and he had his own army mm. and he was also rather hot-headed they mm. felt and was, was maybe likely to go at half cock mm. and they, they were up in, they were down in Limerick for Tom and Sean and a few others were down in Limerick for Christmas 1915 and they had to come up very rapidly because uh, they heard word that O'Connolly was having his men do manoeuvres outside the gates of Dublin Castle at night and was attracting a good deal of attention of the mm. wrong sort. And they, so they had to gallop back up to Dublin and that is the time when this famous possible kidnap occurred. Mm. Connolly disappeared for three days mm. and nobody's quite sure what, what happened mm. there. And Connolly was then brought on board. He was assured that a rebellion was on its way, it was going to happen soon, and then he was brought into the military council. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of uh, writing up the proclamation, uh, his name comes first. Uh, mm. Is that because of uh, his experience? Well, I think the younger men insisted because he, he was iconic. Mm. Uh, like John Daly. John Daly was also iconic in Limerick, mm. and anyone who was anybody in Republican circles went down to Limerick and met John Daly yeah. because he was funding a lot of the stuff and he was seen as one of the old Fenians, you know, who had mm. been out in, in 67 and so on. Yeah. And um, Tom had much the same day. His many years of imprisonment gave him a status mm. with the younger men. At a meeting of the military council, Porrick Pierce had produced a draft version of the proclamation. Thomas J. Clark was the first of the men to sign. He had initially refused the honour, but Thomas McDonough had praised the Fenian's courage and example to the younger men. He said, No man will precede you with my consent. In the year of 16, it all came to a head. When our own rebel hero, he rose from his bed. His comrades around him, they marched to the street With their rifles slung proudly, vile England to me But misfortune fell on them like a bolt from on high For countermand orders to Ireland did fly His great Easter rising they tried hard to save but cruel work had been done by the hand of a slave. The plans for Easter week that Clark had so carefully masterminded began to fall apart on Good Friday. With the arrest of Roger Casement in County Kerry and the scuttling of the odd, this prompted Owen McNeil to issue a countermanding order calling off the rising late on Holy Saturday. And in the lead-up to the rise in the old McNeil County Command, he took it very badly. Uh, from what I read, it was like the darkest day or the blackest oh, day. Oh yes, it was the blackest day. I mean, he, he thought the whole thing had just fallen apart. The countermand just broke him, I think. He, he just couldn't believe that they had their... They, they were in touching distance. Mm. And this thing was obviously going to create an immense amount of, of uh, turmoil and confusion. Nobody would know what was going on. 
The Supreme Council met at Liberty Hall on Easter Sunday, and Thomas Clark was the only council member to argue for a rebellion to go ahead that evening. Instead, it was voted upon to delay it until the following day. Sean McGarry recalled the conversation with Clark that evening. Clark was very silent. After a while, he recovered and discussed the affair. He regarded McNeil's action as one of the blackest and greatest of treacheries. But having said all he wanted to say about it, he did not refer to it again. So very many of the volunteers just didn't turn out the next day. They didn't know who to answer, who to who to believe, whose orders to follow. Mm. A lot of them just said, no, I'm, "I'm staying home." With a new proclamation and bright hopes for their land in fair Dublin city, these men made their stand. They knew that alone they must strike the blow. So outmanned and outgunned to their fate did it go. When Tom Clark arrived in the GPO, he helped the volunteers to smash the windows. He then stood by Pierce outside the GPO, who read the proclamation of the Irish Republic. Lord Wimborne wrote a rapid dispatch to Chief Secretary Burrell, saying, The worst has happened just when we thought it averted. The post office is seized. Almost all wires cut. Bridges blown up, everybody away on holiday. Charles Macaulay, a surgeon called to the GPO, was impressed by the sight of Tom Clark, sitting with a bandolier across his shoulders and a rifle between his knees. He was silent and had a look of grim determination on his face. Sean McGarry also commented on Clark's cool demeanour. His normal air of business seemed to have been accentuated and he gave his orders decisively and as calmly as if he were in his own shop. Patrick Rankin managed to make his way to the GPO on Tuesday. He remembers that Clark looked about 30 years younger and seemed so happy you would imagine you were talking to him in his old shop in Parnell Street. He seems to be completely exalted, the descriptions of him being so happy, you know, and mm. sitting there with a smile on his face. He yeah. just couldn't believe it. He was sitting in the middle of this chaos, watching everybody <laughs> breaking through windows and setting up rifle points and, and barricading themselves in and yeah. thinking, my God, I've done it, you know. Sarka McMahon, a common man courier, told Kathleen, Mr. Pierce would make you laugh. He was going around the GPO like one in a dream, getting in the way of those trying to get things in order. And Mr. Clark said, For God's sake, will someone get that man an office and a desk with paper and pens and set him down to write? Michael Collins. On the Tuesday, two Irish lads who had been caught red handed by one of our patrols in the act of looting a shop were brought into the post office and before Tom Clark. The old man was furious. Shame on you both, he thundered to desecrate the name of Ireland in this fashion. You should be shot where you stand. Sure, shooting is too good for a looter. And while the two wretched prisoners trembled under his tongue lashing, our leader seemed to be on the point of ordering their instant execution. A minute went by, and then, disgustedly and scornfully, he ordered them to be led away to the kitchen to peel potatoes. Dermot Lynch. When quiet again reigned inside the building, I suggested to Tom Clark that we take a look through the letters which had been sorted into a pigeonhole marked RIC headquarters. Tom smilingly agreed. They afforded interesting reading. We chuckle at the fact that all their spying was now in vain and that neither they nor their supporters had realised the imminence of the climax. Min Ryan, okay. coming on GPO. Then I had a talk with Tom Clark in the kitchen that Tuesday night. The gist of it was that people naturally now would be against them for rising and coming out like this. In any case, a rebellion was necessary to make Ireland's position felt at the peace conference so that its relation to the British Empire would strike the world. I asked him, why a republic? He replied, you must have something striking in order to appeal to the imagination of the world. He said that our only chance was to make ourselves felt by an armed rebellion. Of course, he added, we should all be wiped out. He had got into the one thing he had wanted to do during his whole lifetime. 
Leslie Price was in the GPO. She actually married Tom Barry later on. So she goes by the name of Leslie DeBerra most of the time later on. But during the middle of the week, Tom Clark asked her to go to the, uh, the Pro Cathedral to bring a priest over because there were men who were there who were wounded, dying, and, they, and he, he wanted them to get some spiritual comforting. She did, she went to the GPO. There was fighting going on all the time, so it was a very dangerous mission. It took a tremendous amount of courage just for anyone to leave the GPO with all the bullets flying. When she got to the uh, to the Pro Cathedral, she knocked on the door of the rectory, and she did so two or three times before someone would even answer. And it was Father Flanagan, and he, she asked him to come over, but he, he refused. And he said at first that no, that he thought that these people were wrong, and he did not want to get involved with that. So she pleaded with them, and she said that there were people over there who were being wounded, some might have died, and they needed some spiritual comforting. So finally he acquiesced, and he did so. We got to the post office, and I brought Father O'Flanagan to Tom Clark. I remember Tom Clark took Mick Staines aside, and he said on no account was he, the priest, to be let out of the post office. James Connolly had been wounded twice, once in the arm and once by a ricocheting bullet in the ankle. He had been at the forefront of the insurrection all week. Now he lay in a stretcher. Eamon Dorr On Friday, Sean McGermida called me and said he and Tom Clark and a few others were going to have something to eat. It was about three o'clock. I went with him upstairs and seated at that table where Tom Clark, Sean McGermida, Jermud Lynch, Sean McGarry and myself. We had a fried mutton chop each. Where they came from I do not know, but I was hungry. It was the first real meal in days. While we were eating, Father John Flanagan, Pro Cathedral, who had come in earlier to attend the wounded, came into the room and Sean McGarry said, Hello Father, would a fellow go to hell for eating meat on this Friday? Why, Sean, said he, because Father, I'm going to chance it. It was the last joke for a good while. Ah! Tom Clark deplored the fact that the burning of the buildings had deprived us of a glorious fight in which he felt that even with our limited resources, we could give as good as we got. Liam Tannum Finally, pieces of burning timber began to fall from the ceiling over us. I heard Tom Clark declare that he would never leave the GPO alive. He said, you could all go and leave me here. I'll go down with the building. He had an automatic pistol and was finally prevailed upon to go with the others. I think it was Sean McDermott who finally persuaded him. The GPO had to be evacuated. Leslie Price said the last person she saw coming out of the GPO was Tom Clark. He shook her hand and said, If you see my wife. Stopping for a moment, he continued, Tell her the men were wonderful to the... He could not continue, but she knew he meant end. She saw that he was very pent up. All headed anyway for, for Moore Street. I, I'm part of the uh, relatives of, of concerned relatives of signatories of proclamation who are trying to fight for the, for the recognition that this was a whole battlefield site and should be preserved. Luke Kennedy, witness statement. Machine guns were stationed at the rotunda entrance which made it almost impossible for us to cross Moore Lane. 
Tom Clark, who was at the head of the column, called out for volunteers to try and get across, and he led three of us, making four in all. Oscar Trainer. We reached the corner of Muir Street, and Clark called upon me to occupy these buildings, and to dig from one building to another in order to extend our position. We smashed our way into the building and progressed as instructed from house to house. We continued to extend our line until we reached the lane which intersects Muir Street about 50 yards from Parnell Street. I, at this stage, reported back to say that the line had now been extended as far as it was possible to go. Later on, Leo Henderson came in and told Clark he had a bed for him. Then Clark got up and with difficulty made his way over the men stretched out on the floor. According to Kathleen, during the night, Clark wrote in the wall, Fifth Day, Irish Republic. In the same house, he wrote in pencil on a door jam. The piece of wall is now in the National Museum of Ireland. That evening, Joe Good said that headquarters staff consisting of Porrick Pierce, Plunkett, James Connolly, but not Tom Clark, passed the night in one room. James Connolly lay in the bed and was conscious the whole time. Most of the men by this time were utterly tired, exhausted and apparently despondent. Due to the heavy civilian casualties inflicted by the British, it was decided to surrender. And the decision was made to surrender because Pierce saw a family being shot down under a white flag and became aware of the extent of the civilian casualties. Joe Good has said, I was sent from the room to get Tom Clark. He was standing alone at a window some few houses away. He came into the headquarters staff room. I did not hear the conversation which followed, but I knew they were discussing the surrender, as I heard sufficient of the letter, which was read out openly, to know what terms were being sought. Sean McGarry They were both together. Tom was very quiet. McDermott on the verge of tears. McDermott said, We have to ask the lads to give up themselves and their guns to surrender. There was anguish and bitterness in that speech. And Tom was, had to be, was practically in tears. He, he didn't want to surrender. He was terrified also of being sent back to prison. He could mm. never have coped with that. And apparently he considered uh, suicide, mm. but decided that he would make the British pay for the bullet and um, not do it himself. Desmond Ryan. A final council of war was held. By a majority, it was agreed to surrender. Tom Clark alone stood against the decision. He had been through too much to see this fight end in defeat. However, he changed his mind. He wished to keep the executive looking united and not give anyone the chance to say there had been a split among the leaders. McGermida came to Elizabeth O'Farrell and asked her to make a white flag. Tom Clark was standing by the window. He broke down and Winifred Carney went to him only to burst into tears herself. They held each other for a few moments. Sean McLaughlin took the news badly, but Clark patted him on the back and said, Don't take it like that, Sean. There are bigger things involved. You did your best. Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell was sent from Muir Street to Parnell Street, where the Red Cross insignia were taken from her uniform, and was brought to General Lowe, who was sitting in Tom Clark's shop. He listened to her, had her driven back to Muir Street with the message that unconditional surrender was necessary within half an hour. Under Plunkett's orders, the rest of the survivors began to move down Muir Street. Willie Pierce headed the main body, waving his white flag. Close behind him walked Tom Clark and towards the rear walked Sean McGermida and Joseph Plunkett, supported by Julia Grennan and Winifred Carney. They were all, I mean, hundreds of them all, all cooped up in the Rotunda Gardens for the whole night, men and women together. Eamon Dore Memoirs They were herded into the front garden of the Rotunda Maternity Hospital. Captain Leah Wilson was yelling that no one must stand up, that no one must lie down, and as for the needs of nature, Anyone who chooses the Rotunda Gardens for a bedroom can use it as a lavatory as well. Tom Clark was singled out by Leah Wilson. He took him out for an interrogation, shouting, This old bastard has been at it before. He is a shop across the street there. 
He's an old Fenian. Tom's arm had stiffened, and in order to get his coat off, Wilson tore that arm open again. Tom Clark, before the rising, had suffered from an accidental gunshot wound by Sean McGarry. Joe Sweeney. Anyone who put his foot out of line got a whack of a rifle butt. We were kept there all night, and a British officer, Leah Wilson, took out poor old Tom Clark, and with the nurses looking out of the windows of the hospital, he stripped him to the buff and made all sorts of disparaging remarks about him. He's supposed to have uh, sort of shouted at Tom and, and injured him and stripped his clothes off mm. in front of the nurses who were looking out from the, the windows of the rotunda. So th that seems to be a true story. Uh, Michael Collins kept an eye on Lee Wilson and apparently the, the squad murdered him some years later. Uh, in, in, in retaliation for what he had done to, to Clark. Julia Grennan has said, Clark was questioned for an hour and said the whole record of his life had been read out to him. Everything, they have everything, he said. Brian O'Higgins remembers, they haven't overawed him at all events. They were marched off to Richmond Barracks. Despite the jeering and abuse, Tom Clark marched proudly the whole way. William Whelan witness statement. Tom Clark was in the file in front of me when we halted in Richmond Barracks and he gave me a large sum of money. He said, Bill, you take this, I won't need it anymore. I don't know the amount of money, but I am sure it could have been about £50. Clark knew he was finished then. Pierce Beasley has said, Clark spoke cheerfully, confidently. This insurrection Though it has failed, will have a wonderful effect on the country. We will die, but it will be a different Ireland after us. Liam O'Brien has said, Clark was sitting there, just as we had seen him 20 times in the shop in Parnell Street, with the same clothes, the same look, quite silent, with the suspicion of a smile. Tom was very satisfied with himself and the situation. McDermott fell asleep with his head on Tom's chest. We would hear a mutter from him. The fire, the fire, get the men out. Then you would hear Tom's quiet voice saying gently, Quiet, Sean, we're in the barracks now, we're prisoners now. General Maxwell dismissed the women prisoners as silly little girls. However, Maeve Kavanagh McDowell recalls in her witness statement, He was always keen to give women a proper place in every organisation. His wife was very certain of his commitment to women's equality. He had a high opinion of women as companions and fellow workers. In Richmond Barracks, Clark wrote a note to his wife, but she did not receive it until three weeks after the surrender. 30th of April 1916 Dear Kay, I am in better health and more satisfied for many a day. All will be well eventually, but this is my goodbye, and now you are ever before me to cheer me. God bless you and the boys. Let them be proud to follow the same path. Sean McDermott is with me and McGarry. All well. They're all heroes. I'm full of pride, my love. Yours, Tom. It was written on a small page torn from a notebook and pencil. She later traced over it in ink in case it would fade. Clark said to Kathleen that he had refused to talk to a priest who had urged him to confess his sin. I told him to clear out of my cell quickly. I was not sorry for what I had done, I gloried in it, and the men who had been with me. He wanted her to work to keep Owen McNeil out of any future nationalist movements. He is a weak man, and I know every effort will be made to whitewash him. Michael Softley, Dublin Metropolitan Police Constable, Witness Statement 189. There was great admiration among the staff of the jail for the manner in which the executed leaders met their faith, especially Tom Clark who, notwithstanding his age and frail constitution, expressed his willingness to go before the firing party without a blindfold. This was not allowed. Clark left a message for the Irish people, later circulated on a memorial card. I and my fellow signatories believe we have struck the first successful blow for freedom. The next blow, which we have no doubt Ireland will strike, will win true. In this belief, we die happy.
Watching of James Conley and brave men like peers who fought a rebellion for a free Irish race. But the leader among them, long kept in the dark, is our own rebel hero, the bold comes But I think it is only the last few years that the real party has played has become known. Uh, and I think it's great that places like Dundalk are really pushing to, to get his name forward. Um, and we should go forward from here because there's an interest in the, the, this period now that I think is only going to grow and develop. Patrick Kelly's son and Billy Kelly's great great grandson to step forward and unveil the statue of his great great grandfather's childhood friend and first secretary of the 1916 proclamation. Our own rebel hero, Thomas J. Clark. Did undergo the cruelest of torture that mankind could know. Fifteen years penal servitude, silent and dark, went the true son of Ireland, the bold Thomas Clark. From the small shop in Dublin, he worked day and night to rally the people. Against England's might They had once tried to break him His spirit to kill But our own Thomas Clark Was unconquered in will In the year of 16 It all came to a head When our own rebel hero He rose from his bed his comrades around him, they marched to the street with their rifles slung proudly by England to me. But misfortune fell on them like a bolt from on high, for countermand orders to Ireland they fly. His great Easter rising they tried hard to save. But cruel work had been done by the hand of a slave. With a new proclamation and bright hopes for their land, in fair Dublin city these men made their stand. They knew that alone they must strike the blow, so outmanned and outgunned, to their fate they did go.